I want everybody to take your Bibles and turn to Revelation in chapter 4. I want us to look at something that she alluded to. And so I ask a question tonight. What's sitting in your room? And I want you to write that down in your heart, on your mind. I want you to write it down somewhere on a piece of paper. What is it that is sitting in your room? What is it that's holding you back? What are the list of excuses or reasons that have become your platform for becoming hot or cold in your faith and your walk with God? Everybody has a reply. Everybody has a thought running through your mind right now. And I want to ask a couple of questions tonight. Are you as close to God as you want to be? Are you as close to God as you want to be? I want everybody to look at this pastor for a moment. You can blame no one for where you stand with God. No church, no pastor, no program. Let me tell you why. Because one day when we exit this life, we will not drag our church with us before God. Neither a pastor, nor a program, or anybody else with us. We will all stand before God for ourselves. So let me ask you a question. What is it that fills this room in your life? As they were sitting there, how many like that scene where she was wanting a hot cup of coffee, but to the taste she knew immediately a cold cup is not a good cup to have? Come on, somebody. Nobody is made to drink lukewarm coffee. Everybody likes their coffee hot or cold. But she drew this off the analogy of something that Jesus had taught in Revelation. And I want you to read with me in Revelation chapter 4, or should I say chapter 3, verses 14. And these words are written in red, and this is what Jesus said. And unto the angel of the church at Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou would be cold or hot. Circle those two words, cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, And neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. But then he says to them, and he says to us, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. That thou mayest be rich and white raiment. That thou mayest be clothed and that thou shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And appear. Anoint your eyes with eye salve so that you may see. Somebody say it's time to take the blinders off. And here's what he says. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and what? Knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. There's two words, and I want you to write them down in verse 19. The word is zealous, and the word is repent. I want everybody to say it out loud with me. Zealous and repent. Say it again. These are two words that nobody in this room can overlook. And we're going to come to those words in just a few moments. The analogy of which was played out on the screen derived its story from the scripture that we have just read, but it goes even deeper. You see, in the day that Jesus was speaking, he knew that the hearer would understand its meaning because the aquifers and the aqueducts of that day would bring water from long distances. They didn't have a hot water heater like we did today. They depended it to travel down avenues and valleys, and they depended on the travel of that water to reach its destination, of which there were warm, or should I say, hot water springs that would feed this water to the people. And the people, without having to warm it, would receive that hot water, which was good for many things. But there was a problem. The further away that you got from the source... The colder the water became. I want you to write that down. The further the water gets from the source, the colder the water became. I want to say it again. 
This may be the greatest statement that I make all night long. The further one gets away from the source, the colder the water became. I want everybody to close your eyes with me for just a moment. Now, I know there may be some that don't know Christ in this room, and before you leave, you'll have that opportunity. But for those of you that have accepted Christ, I want everybody to close your eyes a moment. And I want you to travel back with me to the day that you found Christ. Would you take just a moment to remember where you were? Would, in closing your eyes, go back to the place where you met grace, where your life was changed. The song that had been sung, maybe you had forgotten the message that had been preached. Maybe it wasn't even in a church. Maybe it was sitting somewhere at a home or in a car. Maybe it was sitting outside under a tree. But I want you to locate not just the place, but I want you to locate your heart there. Do you remember what it felt like the moment that your sins rolled away? Do you remember what it felt like in your soul and in your heart when you stood up, you walked out for the first time, knowing what it meant to be born again, to be saved. The joy. The peace. I want you to take that a step further in your heart with your eyes closed. I want you to travel beyond the moment to the next day. Do you remember the infancy, the purity, the sincerity of your passion? Do you remember or have you forgotten the zeal, the joy, the fire that you could not contain and you wanted to tell the whole world? You wanted, you had to tell somebody what God had just done for you. Somebody say it's hot in here. You see, between the source of that moment to the day, what is it a long life journey that has taken you either closer to God or through time, life, and circumstances if you evaluate your own heart, not to condemn it, so that you can prepare to change something that you would say, I've gotten further away from the source throughout the months, the years, the decades. Before we open up our eyes, I want to leave you with a question to be answered before we leave tonight. Are you satisfied with your heart's passion for Christ on this night, this many days, months, years, and decades later, compared to the time when you first met Him? I ask you the question, has the river of your zeal and passion gotten closer or further from the source I submit not to the church body but to you have you become cold hot or are you satisfied being lukewarm I want you to open up your eyes with me for a moment Jesus said that there would come a culture and the culture of the days of which we live would say that they were so deceived that what I have just asked you, no one in the church would ever give it thought. Because to go from being hot and on fire for God to cold, it takes a great deal of effort. Now, you may not think so, but it does because it takes a process. How many understand you didn't get to where you are tonight in one day? Let me see your hand. Life happens little by little. I want everybody to say that with me. Little by little. How does life happen? Little by little. How do we age? Little. We would be horrified at the age of 20 if we saw ourselves at 85 the next day. The Lord's gracious to us. He gives us little by little. 
How is it that we go from being on fire for God to lukewarm, to cold? Uh, I submit to us tonight, little by little. There is something that in Revelation that this story was derived from, and I said we would come back to these words, and I, I want to make good on it. And I want you to write them down. I want you to rehearse them with me, found in Revelation chapter 3. And here's what he says. He said, I implore of you to buy from me eye salve so that you can see. I want everybody to understand something. This is not about condemnation. This is about self-evaluation. You need to write that down. This is not about condemnation. It's about self evaluation and being being honest with ourselves enough to say God am I pleased with where I am with you and may I just go ahead and tell you so you understand pastors not in a comparison journey tonight comparing you to me or me to you I am not satisfied where I am with God that may help some of you just kind of take a deep breath and go well the pastor's not satisfied with where he is with God maybe we can have the courage to face not religion but face relationship in the face. Everybody say, do not face religion. Face relationship. You see, religion is not something that you grow into. Religion is a form of the real thing. God is a person and He wants a relationship with every single person in this place. How many understand that our life revolves around relationships. Let me see your hand. And in our culture, the less relationships that one have, the more isolated we become. And the more isolated one becomes, the more people begin to feel the effects of aloneness and depression and stress. Simply because the God who created us never created us to ever be alone. In the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings is what that means. The book of creation. The Bible said when God looked at all that he created, he said it is good. But what would call this omnipotent God who knows everything before it happens to create something and then look at it and say this is not good? I'm not talking about an opinion of the creation. I'm talking about the response of the creator to his creation. And he says, it is not good for man to be alone. The reason I believe that God gave us that analogy is because throughout Genesis Revelation, he uses word pictures of comparison, analogies, so that we understand earthly things, so that when he speaks of these spiritual things, we have a greater grasp and understanding. If it is not good for us to walk through life alone, would it dare him be saying to us, I have already created the answer to whom you should walk out this life with? Listen. I don't know why the Holy Spirit's having me say this tonight, but this is for somebody. When you fill your life up with humanity and labels of relationship, regardless of what that person is to your life, husband, wife, friend, co-worker, neighbor, sports, friend, partner, whatever it is, that person that is connected to your life to meet a relationship need will never exceed the first primary relationship you were created for, and that is to walk with your Creator and to walk with your God. And when you surround your life with building relationships that become premier and more important than the first, at that moment it doesn't matter how many people you build relationships with, Nothing will ever satisfy. Have you ever, heard the, have you ever heard the saying, I need this person to complete me? Who's ever heard that? Somebody said, I, I need this person in my life to complete me. Only to come into that covenant of relationship and realize they do not complete them. Why? What is the mystery? The mystery is no mystery at all. God in his creating us did so by divine design. Everybody say, I'm divinely designed to walk through life with the one who created me, redeemed me, and bought me with a price. I am in an eternal relationship with him. I get to choose. 
whether that relationship, that journey is cold, lukewarm, or hot. I'm going to mention a word to you tonight, and I'm just flowing with this. It's called the blame game. You need to write that word down. Because it's not a childhood game, we all play it. At some point in our, we play the blame game. We, we, we register within our heart the things that distract us, defeat us, or destroy us. And if not careful, then we excuse those things and we get comfortable thinking we're just one of the thousands everybody goes through life. So listen to me carefully. We began to accept our condition. And then we live tormented because then we start living by comparison. How many know that the Bible said the devil is the accuser of the brethren? Let me see. Years ago, the Lord gave me this thought. The first thing the devil does in the life of any person is to amuse them. To amuse them. Sin, who, whatever pastor said sin wasn't fun, was a liar. If sin was not fun, so many people would not be attracted to sin. He amuses people like an amusement park to to vie for their attention, their desires, their appetites, and he pulls them in and amuses them. And then the very thing that he amuses them with becomes confusion. He amuses, then he confuses. And when he has us in his grip, then he accuses us. You're a failure. You're not good enough. You can't go worship with those people. You're a hypocrite. Come on, somebody. Who do you think you are? Look at that person. Now, that's a real Christian. Oh, I'm, I'm teaching to somebody. Uh, you can't sing. You can't worship. You can't praise. You can't even live the life. Because look at those people who do it so much better than you. And all the while, every bit of what I have just described is a deploy to bring you further away from the source of which when you closed your eyes a few moments ago for those who remembered when you first found him and he found you. Little by little. Doesn't matter if it's 10 years, one day, 90 years, just so long as the end result of those who have a relationship with Christ go from being hot to cold. But what about those who live in the lukewarm zone? Jesus had something very specific to say about being lukewarm. Notice, now this is going to mess with your theology. Jesus said, I didn't say this, Jesus said it. Jesus said, I'd rather you be cold or hot. No, no, notice it wasn't an option of three. Gee, I don't know if that gets to you or not because most people who listen to the hot doctrine, is if you just got to be hot and on fire for God. Let me just tell you, I have not always been hot for God. And even in my walk in the Christian faith, there have been seasons that it has been winter. Maybe I'm the only one living in this world breathing human air. While we put on the smile and we do through the things and we go through the motions trying to tap into our feelings to somehow catch up with the revival fire that's being poured out, so that we can go home, live in amusement and in confusement, and then being accused that we're nothing more than a hypocrite. Because we can't locate this feeling. Everybody say, your faith is more than a feeling. This is going to help somebody tonight. Your faith is more than a feeling. God never used your feelings to be the barometer of your walk with Him. That's why He said clearly, the just shall live by faith. Oh, I'm going to get to something here. The just shall live by what? Let me rehearse this with us. The just shall live by good singing. What happens when they sing the songs you don't like? Then so goes your faith. The just shall live by a pastor or personality. Denomination? No, the just shall live by faith. And then he tells us how faith comes. The scripture says faith comes by now, I want you to write this down because this has everything to do with turning your hot water cold. Who you choose to listen to and what you choose to listen to will, food, will feed the aquifer 
of your faith. In fact, uh, I experienced this today. I took a cup of coffee and I took one sip and it was too, it was too hot. The first thing I looked for was cold water that happened to be conveniently sitting beside the coffee pot of where I was standing and guess what I did? It was my choice, my decision, and I didn't put a whole lot of it in there. Just a little will do. How do we get from hot to cold? Somebody say it with me. Little by little. I didn't stand there for an hour. It didn't even take a second and a half. The hot coffee became instantly lukewarm when my hand touched the cold and let just a little fill its vessel. I want everybody to look at the pastor for a minute. Your relationship with God is not fed and cannot be responsible for anybody else than you. It was my hand that picked up the cup. It was my hand that touched the faucet. You get to determine what enters into the aquifer of your faith. Let me tell you some things that will cause you to go from cold to hot. Gossip will cause your faith to go from hot to lukewarm. Why? Because anything that takes your eyes off Jesus, now don't miss this, anything, everybody say anything. Let me upgrade that, anyone. Sometimes it's not anything, sometimes it's someone. Anything or anyone that removes your focus from off of Christ has by their little effort made the first attempt to create a faith in you that is lukewarm rather than hot. You get to determine, I get to determine what I listen to, what I allow people to speak in my presence, how much cold water of criticism. I'm speaking to somebody because, listen, I don't know who this is for, but sometimes the aquifer that is hot called our faith is diluted and caused to become lukewarm by the choices that we make. And some by times it's by allowing others after we have filled our heart with the hot bread and the hot word of God with the cold criticism and the coldness of compromise. Oh, am I teaching this thing tonight? And little by little we sit on pews and we go through motions and we live our life not realizing that we ourselves by the enemy's attempt are being drawn from the source. I want to ask you the question, who is your source? You need to write that down. Because let me tell you something. There's a whole lot of church folk don't know who their source is. Now, you said, oh, they, 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 if they didn't know who their source was, they wouldn't come to church. Let me tell you something. The devil comes to church. In fact, sometimes we pride ourselves in the fact that we know Christ by the activities that we do that is connected to the things of Christ. But ladies and gentlemen, isn't it possible that you can know something about somebody but not know them? How many's ever heard of Pete Rose? Let me see your hand. How many's heard a lot about Pete Rose? Let me see your hand. How many knows all the facts about Pete Rose? And I know a few in here that do. You, you, you know a lot about Pete Rose. But how many, if I were to go ask Pete Rose, do you know Jeff Andrews? <laughs> Lying will cause your hot <laughs> to become lukewarm. <laughs> we lie to ourselves sometimes. I'm going to throw a big one at you tonight, and I'm throwing it at me. When God is asked, do you know them? What will be his reply? You say, Pastor, why do you offer that? Because in the book of Revelation, it talks about when humanity stands before God and all of the ages give an account and we stand before Him. This is not my words. This is the words of Scripture. The Bible said the saddest things ever said, to, it is the saddest thing that will ever be said to all of humanity. And Jesus forewarns us of the potential that it could happen to anyone. And He said, they will stand before me and say, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do great and wondrous works? Did we not pray in your name? Now let me call a time out in slow motion, freeze frame that for a minute, so that we don't lie to ourselves to think he's talking to the world. Let me remind you, the world does not pray in his name. Neither do they cast out devils in his name. 
And the Bible said he said to them, you workers of iniquity. Does anybody know what he said? I never knew you. You said, Pastor, what would produce that? A form of religion adopted as a personal daily relationship with Jesus Christ, absent of the relationship with Jesus Christ. What does that look like? Going to church every time or ever so often? But not with Christ in your heart. Going to Bible study, listening to good music, being a good person, but yet not having that relationship and that covenant with Christ. There are certain things that are in relationships that are unmistakable. How many understand that everybody, you're not in relationship with everybody? Let me see your hand. You're not in relationship with everybody. But how many would, would, would assess with me in your own life? There are some people that you're in relationship with. Let me see your hand. And in your heart and in your mind, there are certain, there are certain unnegotiables that constitute a relationship. The first one is that you must know them. Write it down. Do you know them? Do you know Christ? Or do you know about Christ? Sing all the songs about Christ. Talk about the goodness of the Holy Spirit. But do you know Him? And secondly, this is where we're going to walk into the war room before we close. Now, everybody say, we're going, to, we're going to the war room. By the way, everyone has one. Some, some rooms have just been left vacant. Others have never turned the light on. Ask the question to everybody, does everybody have a war room? And people will gauge that answer according to the movie because in their mind will remember the movie was a certain room, some place, somewhere. But let me caution you that if not careful, we will get enthused about prayer and go add decor to a room so that we can say we've got what they've got in the movie and miss the substance of what we have. Let me submit to you, the purpose of the movie War Room was not to in excite us about prayer and just to encourage us about prayer and to enthuse us about prayer. It was to call us to the lifestyle of prayer. One pastor said it best, Bill. He said, my greatest concern is there's going to be a frenzy that goes through the body of Christ like a fad and everybody's going to buy the War Room t-shirts and the War Room this and we're going to talk about War Room rooms the only the only sad part of it is that nobody is going to practice what we preach so i'm not insinuating tonight that in these unnego that these these unnegotiable relationship characteristics the first one's to know everybody say spend time with him if i never spend time with you ever how long will it be what was a close friendship becomes a separated friendship that works in all aspects of life this is not a church thing this is a life thing how long Jeff stand up to help me here how long can I go from your heart being shared with my heart from my back turn being turned to you still in your presence you haven't changed but I have changed D did you notice this his posture remains the same let me tell you something about the God we serve. He loves you so much, he's ever consistent. Does anybody have a friend that's ever consistent? I don't know anybody in this world that's ever consistent. He said, I will never leave you. Here's what that covenant looks like. I will never leave you. I'm walking, but he's with you. I'm taking some turns in life, but he's there. I'm walking in some places I don't belong but he is not a God that he should lie. And when I fail to see him, and I think I'm alone, it's not that he has failed. It's that I have turned my life into a direction that has lost view of who he is to me. The moment you... God, I feel there's a strong, heavy anointing on me right now to say this. God, before his return is calling out to his sons and daughters. There's not a mother and father that don't love their children. No matter how old they get, you want them by your side. You want to see the best for them. And your heavenly father, the Bible said, will withhold no good thing. And he's wooing and he's drawing and he's calling and he's using every means by all means. And by the way, even circumstances that may be unacceptable to you and highly uncomfortable of which in our religious mode we have asked to be delivered 
Lord, if you'll just deliver me from, I pose to us the question, to be delivered from something is to be delivered to something. I've seen people walk away from altars going, thank you, God, for deliverance. And I ask myself the question, God, from this, where will their feet walk into? And there are people that they, they ask God to deliver them for the wrong motives because they don't like the way it feels. They don't like the way they feel. They don't like the uncomfortable. But sometimes God will use the temporary to turn you around to affect you for the eternal. You listen to me tonight. Life is not forever. But eternity is. You need to write that down somewhere. Life, this life is not forever, but eternity is. Keep walking with me, Jeff. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Everybody in this room has a war room. Before this four weeks is out, I'm not asking you to go to your room or to go to your house and if you have a room that's dedicated and you're motivated by what you've done, oh boy, this is good stuff right here, and you're motivated by what you've dedicated to Him, then that's not a waste of square footage and time. But be careful. Because it could be that we get so inspired that we create all the trappings of what is holy and what is helpful and what is needed and necessary in order to grow close to God and leave it as a room without intimacy and a room that is void of purpose. It becomes a holy place only because we have shrouded it with forms of potential and godliness, but we ourselves are absent of that room. Everybody say, the war room only has accommodation for two. I get so sick of people saying, how many people will this building seat? You know what I start telling people when they ask me that now? Two. <laughs> They'll look at me like I'm a bit crazy and out of my mind. They'll say, this, this room seats more than two people. And I remind them that God never raised up buildings so that he could fill buildings. He raised up people so that he can fill them with himself. You can walk into a church. Sing about God, hear about God, talk about God. The only thing absent from the equation is God. Here's what I believe God's going to do before His return. I really believe this. He's going to allow the church corporate to be deluded to the place of oneself so that we no longer see the church as a building, but we see ourselves as His church with a purpose and with a mission. As his church, what are you doing tonight to build a war room in your life? What are you allowing to sit in this seat? Every war room, and I say this in closing tonight, listen to me carefully. Whether you have a physical place that you are going to create over this next week. Some of you maybe have already created a place at home or at your office. It's a dedicated space. It's a dedicated place. But I want to go further than that. I want to go deeper than that. More than ge geographical location with walls and chairs. Let this symbolize something far deeper that cannot be erased. Where are you going to build a war room in your life so that you're ready to fight the battles of everyday life? Where is it that you will create a room of intimacy where only you and God are welcome? Now notice what I didn't say. Not you, God, and John Hagee. Not, oh, not you, God, and Perry Stone. Not you, God, and Barry Clarty. Everybody just say, you and God. You and God. Now, I'm going to say something that's really going to mess some people up here tonight. When's the last time without taking somebody else into the war room with you by book or CD or video that you dared to go in and sit and wait on the king of glory. See, we're fiddlers. You know what a fiddler is in the South? We're fidgety. <laughs> we got to have our attention grasped by something. That's why no longer it's acceptable for churches to have a worship service where you can just preach the word because the word for too many people has become too bland. 
we got to have some dancing with it. We got to have some songs with it. We got to have this with it and that with it. And we got some smoke and clouds and we got to have a lot of wow factors. The only factor about being wowed is sometimes we get wowed, but we don't get God. And so we live off of the wow. And when the wow is up, our faith is up. And when the wow is down, we are down. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, a one-way ticket to a cold life live for God is to let the barometers of your faith be set by what you see and what you feel and what you hear. Anybody that's been in relationships know that relationships ebb and tide. How many understand that? They ebb and tide. There's good days, there's difficult days, there's ups and there's downs. I have found that there's days with God, I don't feel Him at all. Can I just be blunt? There are some days I don't feel God. Now, you try pastoring a church like this and say, you mean to tell me there's some days you don't feel God? But you see, that hasn't become my barometer. My faith is my barometer. I lean on the fact when I don't see Him, He sees me. When I don't feel Him, He feels with a feeling of His, my, come on somebody, with a feelings of infirmity. He knows how I feel. You know why? Because he's been alone. That's what some of us miss. We miss the fact he's been where you're at. And the next place you're destined to be, he's already been there, done that, and he's bought victory with your name on it. That's why in the garden, no one was with him. He knew what it felt like to be alone, hanging on a cross suspended between heaven and earth. That's why the, the, the word records, not Reader's Digest, Hollywood, climactic ending. It said, he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? And sometimes we get this dig with God because we feel forsaken as if he doesn't know what that feels like. Tonight, I want you to create a war room with me, not for me, but for you. And I want this war room not to be for three, but to be for two. I want everybody to be very clear when you leave here tonight. Your war room, whether it is a geographical location that you're going to build, or whether it's a place in your heart, more importantly, in your life, because that, guess what? The tabernacles that God created were made to move. That's why I said be very careful just dedicating one space to God. Because if not careful, you, everybody said little by little, you'll start worshiping that place. And you'll think the only place that God can talk to you is right there. Everybody take your hand and put it on your heart. I want you to pray this prayer after me, dear Lord. Create a war room within my heart. Where there's only a place for the two of us. Where you talk with me. And I talk with you. I wait on you as you teach me, as you guide me, as you empower me. I declare tonight that there, hallelujah, that there are no vacancies in this house. I am sold out. Fill every room. Fill every thought. Fill every action with the all of who you are. Stand with me everywhere. Thank you. I asked the question when I came. How many enjoyed this tonight? It's, now somebody's going to say, I thought it was a teaching. I told you this is not a teaching. This is a... Somebody touch three people around you and say it's a journey. Now, here's what you need to know. I love journeys because you never know where God's going to take you, Bill. Awesome. Here's what I promise you, everybody, look at this preacher. Wherever God chooses to take you through this journey, I make you a promise. It'll be better than where you're at tonight. Mm. Notice what I said, wherever you choose, whatever you choose. So tonight, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm not a fool to this. I really am not looking for a response. I'm looking for an effect. I want God to affect our lives. See, the response of a hand clap and a hallelujah and amen is very short-lived when your heart's not there. And here's what I want to ask everybody in this room. And nobody will come back to you. Nobody's going to say, look at them. You see, I want to be so pure about this. I don't want you to feel like you've got to get on my page to get to heaven at the same time. 
no car on 275 gets to the same location at the same time at the same place. How many understand when you're on 75 going to work, it would be a tragedy if everybody was going the same speed at the same place at the same time? Let me see your hands. So I want you to look to your neighbor and confess to them boldly, this is my journey with my God who's taken me somewhere that I've never been. But when I get there, it will be better than where I am tonight. I will be closer, more in love, and hot for him. I asked you when I got up a few minutes ago, what's sitting in your seat? You see, there's a lot of people that will create a chair. They'll call it their war room, but the chair already exists. It's called your heart. The throne of your heart. <clears throat> It'd be almost a hypocritical thing for any of us to go decor a room and create a chair and let flesh sit in it and let the divine stay outside the room. I ask you the question tonight, whether I see young people in here, I see middle aged, I see aged, I ask you the question, who or what have you allowed to sit in your chair that causes you to be where you are tonight in Christ? The question is not, does he love you? That question's already been answered. He does. The question tonight of this journey is not necessarily, am I going to heaven? If you know Christ, you are. But the last time I checked, the journey is not about just checking in with a vote of I'm saved and waiting for heaven to come. It's about living the life the way God who created it intended it to be. And to live this life with zeal. And to live it with power. And to live it with purpose. And to live it with passion. Not dragging through the pearly gates, but running through the pearly gates. Warring for my family. Warring for my children. Saying, if nobody else will, I will war on the floor until my sons and my daughters and my grandchildren come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's time to create war rooms. I submit this in this conclusion tonight. We do not need more church buildings. And we don't even need more preachers. We need more people in love with Jesus. Every day, creating war on the floor until you can't get no more. Until there's more of him and less of you. Here is the power of living a hot life for Christ. Everybody say the closer to the source. The hotter the relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, the hotter the relationship. more you're going to see God do. Not because he's not been doing it. We've just been in places where we haven't seen him. Everybody say he's still doing what he's always done. Verse 19 of Revelation chapter 4 said these words. I implore you to be zealous and repent. Everybody say those two words with me. Be zealous and repent. There's a lot of zealous people in the modern day church. But repentance has been erased from the equation. Notice he said, we cannot truly see our condition until we marry the two. Because zeal without repentance produces pride. You remember what he said? You think you're rich, but you're poor. You think you're clothed, but you're naked. You think you have need of nothing, but you have need of much. And what he asked them to do was the turning point. To create that which is cold and lukewarm and set it on fire. You remember in John the Revelator when the Bible talks about being caught up into heaven? And he said, he touched my lips with what? Coals of fire. When's the last line you, time you let God touch your lips so that what comes out of it is more about him than about you? Come on, somebody. When's the last time you've let him touch your heart? And I'm going to ask everyone right now to just begin to walk this way. I know typically we would have a little music, but I don't want that tonight. I just want you to walk because... You have willed to because you want to, because you desire to. This is your journey. This is not you and your wife's journey. This is not you and your family's journey. This is your journey. And here's what I would say tonight. I'm not asking everybody to respond in the same way because if you do, there's a good chance we've done a religious thing. 
You're facing things that I am not. And I'm facing some things that you're not. It's almost hypocritical and sacrilegious for me to insist that we come into a building for an hour and a half and get on the same page so we can feel good about it. Not only is it hypocritical, it brings no lasting results. In fact, let me tell you what it does. The Holy Spirit's been, how many have appreciated the teaching now? It's a flowing. In fact, I don't feel like I'm teaching. I feel like there's a river flowing through here. And the gate is my mouth. And the aquifer is my heart. And the source is his throne. Get a picture of that. The tributary of his truth coming through the heart of man, through the lips of man, entering into the ears of man. And where does it settle? Into the heart of man. There may be some here tonight that don't even know Christ. I want to say this to you. We love you. And so does God. Somebody ought to tell them that with your hands tonight. We love you. And so does God. And if you don't know Christ today, or if you have known Him and you've walked away and you've grown cold, it would be a good time not just to get out a chair and only symbolic to the throne of your heart is to decide tonight who and what's going to sit there from tonight forward. I can let a preacher sit there. I can let a good anointed teacher sit there. Did you know there are some people who have put anointed people before the anointed one? Oh, that's a good one to write down. They have put anointed people before the anointed one. When I get to talk to pastors, and they start talking, and all I ever hear them say, oh, did you hear so-and-so preach? And they never talk about Jesus. Did you get so-and-so's latest book? It's powerful. But they never talk about the book. It tells me that Little by little, if not careful, in a religious way, we can claim to have him on the throne of our hearts. But reality is, we have put people, things, places, and stuff at a higher level than we have him. And tonight's the time for all of us to get some of those things out of the seat. Maybe it's self-pity. Maybe it's self-pride. Maybe it's excuses. Maybe it's hurts. Maybe somebody did you wrong. Whatever that is that's occupying your seat, tonight is your opportunity. Nobody can touch the handle of the faucet but you and determine if cold or hot water comes out and says, God, tonight I command that thing. I order it. Oh, I felt the Holy Spirit. I order that thing out of my life in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. In the name of Jesus. I order. I order that. In fact, I want somebody to write this down. Getting your house in order. God's going to give me a message just to that effect. Getting your house. I order that out of my life. Out of my hearing, I won't listen to that. Out of what I see, what I, what I, what I, 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 I engage. I, I, Lord, I get it out of there. Now, what you put, listen, what and who you put in its place is important, what you just commanded out. The devil is not stupid. He's slick. There are many people who say, I command these things to leave my life. But hell don't care about what leaves your life. His concern is what you transplant in its place. Sometimes religious people just exchange religious stuff in the chair. We play musical chairs. We get pride out, but then we put gossip in. Neither one of them is good for the soul. So I want you to look at this tonight, and I want you to say, God, only you have this seat in my life and heart I've reserved it for you Holy Spirit I've reserved this seat in my heart and life for you now hands all over this building just if you feel like raising them fine if you don't fine but what's important is that you begin to talk with God tonight in these moments that we have begin to just tell him how much you love him begin to confess to him those things that need to get out of that chair of your heart out of that throne room of your heart and invite him to consume you. Consume me, oh God. Consume my family. Consume my life. Consume my heart today. He's in this room. I feel the weightiness of his presence. Just the two of us, Lord. Every day, me and you, Lord. Every day, me and you, God. Someplace, somewhere. Just us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We wait.
weightiness of his presence is there. He's longing for people who will just love him. Allow them. Allow him to love them. Precious time. Anointed time. Crafter, come up here, please. Long before the War Room movie ever came out, God used a circumstance in your life to create a war room, and you didn't know what you were creating. We traveled that together, some of it. Some of it, nobody could travel with you. But while I've been teaching this, the Holy Spirit said there's people like Bill Crouch who long before the movie ever came out, your circumstances created the war room. And then you made the choice. How many days that you could have chose doubt, but you chose his word. And his word sustained you. Somebody said, Pastor, what do you get in the war room? Everybody say peace. It's found in the war room. Everybody say power. power. And there are some days the devil told you to give up. But you got you was in the war room, didn't know what to call it. But it was just you and God. And I, I remember sometimes getting a call from you and you say, Pastor, while I was alone with Jesus. Notice that's an oxymoron. When I was alone with Jesus, we're never alone. He gave me this word. Bill, I want you to pray for us tonight. Everybody receive this blessing. I want you to pray for God's people that as we go through this journey, one by one, little by little, individual, personal, We'll begin to build war rooms in this church. War rooms in our life for our family. Would you pray? I just feel like we need to conclude this night in prayer. Heavenly Father. We come before you with hearts that are thankful. Thankful that we can call you Father. Thankful that you gave provision for us to be your children. If for nothing else, which would ever do anything else, we're thankful just because you're God and you're our Father. Lord, as we've begun tonight this journey, individual journeys, oh Father, to walk with you, to build greater relationships with you. I pray, Lord, that you would bless each and every person along this way as they take steps individually, Lord, to create a space for you, and not just in their homes, but in their hearts, God. That, Father, that there would be a trust in you, that there would be a relationship, that there would never be a doubt. That regardless of circumstances, that regardless of what we face, that there'd never be a doubt that you have us and that we're yours. That in our war rooms, we would build that type of relationship and confidence and trust in you, O oh God. So bless each and every person, O oh Lord. Show each and every person their individual path that they've got to go down. We know, oh Father, that when we have a desire to draw, draw close to you, that that's what your desire is, that you want to see us drawing close to you, and you want us close to you. So bless each and every person tonight, O oh Father. Bless and honor each and every person tonight, O oh Father, for their desire to draw close to you. And you know, we know, O oh Father, that you will draw close to us for that desire. 
something he has for tonight for you, he can say. 